Hey guys, Kevin Bob here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is real estate investment expert Mustafa Lada. Now, Mustafa is the president and founder of Veloce Capital, a highly diversified multifamily investment group that specializes in leveraging secondary and tertiary real estate markets to drive outsized returns for their investors. And so with that, guys, I'd like to welcome Mustafa to the show. How are you doing, my friend? Thank you so much. It's very nice to meet you, and uh, it's an honor to be on the podcast. Yeah, excited to have you here. Excited to, to peel back the uh, the curtain and, and get an understanding of uh, not just who you are as an individual, where you know, kind of how you got your start, but also a little bit more about the you know about the the investment firm that you run. And so, with that, Mustafa, maybe take a few moments, fill in the blanks. I gave you such a a, uh, a abbreviated introduction there. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and who you are, and ultimately how you found your way into this world. Yeah, sure. I think uh, the beautiful thing about, you know, your podcast, I've, I've listened to several of them is, is you really start by understanding, you know, a person's backstory and how they got to where they are and, and then really peel back the layers to see what are they doing in the current environment to, to, you know, drive value creation. So with that being said, uh, I went to Rutgers University, I graduated with a background in genetics, I started working in the pharmaceutical industry, and then I was looking at it, just trying to understand different ways to, to generate more cash flow which is really what your podcast is all about and what real estate, what, what attracts a lot of people to real estate. So I looked at it and I, you know, there's a lot of different ways to invest in real estate. You could go to the mobile home park. I know you're excited and, and you like that avenue. You could go, you know, single family home space. So for me, it was kind of, you know, syndicating, partnering with people who knew more than I did and seeing what value I could create. And that's, that's really the route I went through. I, you know, was able to network with a lot of people on WhatsApp, external to WhatsApp. And I've been able to raise over eight figures, you know, through, through that journey, through that process, just networking with people who are looking, you know, for quality passive investment opportunities. So that's really what I've done over the past, you know, five plus years and structured investments along the way where now people can invest with their retirement money using self-directed IRAs. People can invest you know, without leverage in a Sharia compliant manner, like, you know, sort of like ethical investing. So I've looked at, you know, different underserved niches and really try to improve access to investing, if that makes sense, Kevin. No, that makes sense. I, I appreciate that. And just help us better understand the, uh, the you know, the, the you know, Veloce Capital. I mean, exactly what it is you guys do. I know that you're, you're ultimately in the, the multifamily space, but give us a, a more clear path or lay of the land of, of the business model itself. Sure, sure. So I'm a VP at Veloce Capital. Um, initially, I founded a company called Realty Mercado, which really focused on retirement, you know, raising capital from investors who are looking to use their 401ks or their retirement capital, and people who are looking to invest through a, a Sharia compliance strategy. So they're looking to invest in real estate without leverage, which as most of us are familiar, usually a lot of the structures we use require leverage to really scale our, our return profile. So what Realty Mercado did was they built out a proof of concept to say that there is a demand for this sort of investor who's who's not comfortable with leverage for their own you know religious reasons. And then uh, I was able to use that experience and gain access to Veloce Capital's portfolio of deal flow to then syndicate investment opportunities and structure you know equity funds where Realty Mercado would structure and raise the money. And then they would partner with Veloce Capital to actually allocate and the deal flow and to manage that, that investment process. And, and so what that led to was me taking on a position with Veloce Capital as a, as a VP, where now I also manage a couple of their other investment vehicles for people who are looking for cash flow. We have a debt fund that offers, you know, monthly, quarterly liquidity for investors. So it's it's a highly liquid vehicle with a short investment term of one year. That way investors can kind of get in and out of their positions, more of a promissory note type structure. And then on the other end, and obviously like for you and I, we would look at it and think also like the tax implications of that sort of investment are higher, right? And then other investors on the other spectrum are kind of looking to own that asset long-term and they're looking at, you know, a negative K1 or the tax benefits of those assets. And in a longer term type horizon, investing for 10 years, 20 years, et cetera. So, so that's really been the benefit, you know, from my perspective, working with Veloce Capital over the last several years has been positioning not only myself, but positioning investors in, in a situation where they have an access, they have access to multiple different investment strategies. And then by delivering more ways to invest, we can really tailor in what their goals are, how do they want to make money, and then best align it for them, if that makes sense, Kevin. Yeah, no, got it. And I appreciate that. And 
Um, I know that before we started recording, you'd mentioned that that uh, for the most part, you guys focus on ground up construction. So give us just uh, you know, obviously a lot, lots has changed over the last last twelve months um, on, on a variety of levels, and uh, just I guess give us a sense on what you guys are involved in today, maybe how your business looks today compared to maybe what it looked like a year ago, and then also you know maybe uh, share what you're excited about with the future. Sure, sure, more than happy to. So I think you know last three, four years, we've been in an exciting time. We had COVID, beginning of COVID, where a lot of people, whether they cared to admit it or not, had no idea what was going to happen. It was uh, an uncertain time. Uh, and then we had, you know, in the middle of COVID where things kind of settled and people in the real estate space were like, hey, this isn't too bad. You know, single family house prices are high. There's a lot of demand for, for our product. So we're in a good position. And then we had this environment now where interest rates are rising. And again, people are a bit uncertain. Like what we do, we do ground up construction. Right. So in COVID, you know, supply chain, there were supply chain issues. There's raw material prices going up and, you know, cap rates weren't affected. Rent was going up. So overall, it was net net. It kind of balanced out. Now you're in a situation where interest rates are rising and that affects, you know, cost of construction. Right. So it's, it's one of those things that there's a lot of different things that that is going on in the market. We invest a lot in New Jersey in uh, opportunity zones as well. So there's a lot of tax abatements and it's right outside New York City. So there's a lot of demand. And so for us, you know, we've been in a pretty good position where, where we've been pretty insulated, but even then it can be, it can be challenging. So it's, so it's important to really make sure you're underwriting your deals conservatively, making sure you're, you're creating enough value to, you know, exit your investor's capital. Because for us, that's really what we look at. The reason we go into these types of projects and these types of opportunistic investments is to generate those outsized returns, if that makes sense, Kevin. Yeah. And then, in terms, a... uh -huh. go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry to cut you off. In terms of how things have changed, I think from my perspective, it's really about understanding what the investor wants. A lot of times, investors come to us saying, "Hey, this is my you know shopping list, so to speak. I want cash flow, and uh, I want I don't want to be taxed a lot." And typically, you know, maybe two or three years ago, we would have less of those long term type equity positions because it didn't always make sense for, for the way we're structured and the deal flow that we're seeing. But now because liquidity, because there's less liquidity in the market, because loans are more expensive, we're no longer in this decade long period of low interest rates. So now for a developer, money is more expensive. So they're more willing to give up more equity. So then it creates a unique opportunity where we can go in and we can say, hey, this is a stabilized cash flowing asset. And now our investors can get it at a discount it makes sense for our co-GP, the developer. It makes sense for us. It makes sense for the investor because they're getting something off market at below appraised value. So day one, they're walking into positive, you know, net worth and cash flow, which is which is crucial for them. Yeah, no, no, fantastic. I, I appreciate that. Have um uh one of the things I read in your website is about kind of the you know leveraging your 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 strategy is leveraging somewhat secondary and tertiary markets. Explain to me a little bit more what that means and ultimately what you know what what are the attractor factors to those particular marketplaces that you're going after? Sure, sure. So so everyone I think you know has a different strategy when they approach real estate. And then you kind of zero in over time and you you perfect that strategy. So for us, we've been investing in New Jersey for over a decade. We've deployed over a billion dollars in transactions in that time. So we're, we're pretty good at what we do. And what we look at is what's going to be the, the next big thing. We're not you know, going to Texas or going to Sunbelt because that's what you know, maybe everyone else is doing, so to speak. What we're doing is we're looking at, hey, where can we drive value creation? And fundamentally, what are the strongest markets that are still going to be there in 10, 20 years? And what are the markets that are going to benefit from that growth, right? I'm based in New Jersey. Our firm invests a lot in New Jersey. We do other markets like Baltimore and Atlanta as well. But primarily, a lot of our investing is in New Jersey. And fundamentally, when we look at it at a, at a geographic perspective, it's very close to New York City. It's historically been underinvested in, which has resulted in the creation of an opportunity zone. So there's tax abatements. So there's massive tax benefits for developing there. So there's a couple of different, you know, check boxes that it hits for us that then means it mitigates risk. So then we can comfortably invest our capital. And then over time, we can comfortably go and raise capital from our investor group to say, hey, this is a project that we believe in. And these are similar projects that we've exited on in the past. 
Are there any? Are, I'm not familiar with uh, with uh, New Jersey. Have, have never personally invested there. But are there any risks associated with uh, rent control um, legislation? Anything like that coming down the pipe? So it's a good it's a good question. New Jersey typically, you know, the Northeast in general is typically viewed as as a harder market in terms of raising rent and rent control and and things of that nature. For us, because we're in ground up construction, we don't have that issue. But if you were to go and buy something that's, you know, 20, 30 years old in a value add, traditional value add strategy, you would run into rent control issues. You'd run into uh, affordable housing issues. We don't have that just because of the strategy that we that we execute on. So the, the so ground just so I understand ground up construction then it, it, you you can take it you obviously can you build market rate apartments but so that that rent control doesn't attach to the to the uh, uh to the apartment complex whatever after it's actually been built to where now that if you have to turn over a unit you're not restricted uh, to exactly a certain, exactly okay. so what okay. we'll do is we'll go in and we'll buy that single family house then we'll rezone it. Then and our market is pro rezoning, which isn't necessarily the case in most of the Northeast. All right, so already we're creating a massive amount of value just by rezoning. Then we'll go in, we'll demolish, we'll build an apartment complex, we'll refinance, we'll recapture our initial investment plus profit, and uh, then we'll hold it. Now on top of that, you have you know in the past it was a twenty year tax abatement, now it's a thirty year tax abatement, mm -hmm. where they're taxing you only at the value of the land. So initially when we bought that house. The taxes might have been, let's say, I don't know, hypothetically 10K. When you, when you knock it down, now the taxes hypothetically are like maybe a grand, right? So just by getting rid of the house that was on that piece of land, you're saving so much in taxes. Now, when you build a multi-million dollar asset on top of that land, you're still paying the you know $1,000 in taxes because it's not being assessed on the value of the improvements. It's being assessed on the value of the land. Mm -hmm. no, that's great. Um you know, I read in your bio that, uh, you know, it, it seems though you embrace technology. I mean, obviously you've, you've helped build out a couple of different platforms and um, there was a, a statement that had uh, referenced raising X amount of dollars. I think it was, you know, 10 or $20 million via just WhatsApp alone. Talk to me about just, I guess, generally speaking, you know, leveraging technology and, and how do you, how do you, you utilize it within your, your, for, your firm and organization to raise capital, but more specifically, we'd love to learn a little bit more about the the WhatsApp strategy. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. More than happy, Kevin. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that for, for some of us, it feels like technology is moving really quickly. I don't know if that's the case for you, but it definitely is for me. And it's one of those situations also, it's compounded by the fact that we don't know what we don't know. And that's really how I approach life. So for me about, you know, six years ago, I was looking at, you know, different regulations. I was looking at different business models of how to, how to make money very simply. And I was like, this is the strategy. I'm going to raise capital and this is how I'm going to do it. So I built out a proposal, et cetera. I was going to do a reg A, which if you're in the space, you're familiar with, but basically the idea is that you can raise money from anybody as little as a dollar. And there's a lot of legal compliance required to do that. And as a ballpark figure, I was looking at it and saying, it'll cost about half a million to do, and I'll be able to raise 50 million. Those were the types of numbers that I was looking at. And then when I was building that out, I was trying to understand what's that minimum viable product. Like, you know, in tech, they look at it and they say, what's the smallest thing I can build for the cheapest amount of money to prove out my concept and to scale? So for me, that was WhatsApp. I joined different networking groups and some people do it on Facebook, LinkedIn, different, you know, social media platforms today, TikTok, um, even podcasting. It's all about, you know, positioning yourself as, a, as a, an expert in what you do and then adding value for people and then seeing how that compounds over time. So really, I started with WhatsApp. I built that out. I raised over eight figures, like you mentioned, and it's it's been successful. I can't really complain, you know, zero marketing spend, et cetera. So there's nothing, you know, to be upset about or anything like that. But it's also how do we take that and add more value for people? Because fundamentally, you and I, depending on how we approach our business, we're in a service business. We're looking at it like, how do we create cash flow for other people, right? It's, everyone works hard for their money. Everyone works hard to scale and provide security for their families. And fundamentally, we want people to have access to high quality investment opportunities. And that's what Sunrise Capital is looking for. That's what Veloce Capital is looking for. And we're not, you know, we're looking to establish that credibility and consistency over generations where you can say, hey, listen, you invest with XYZ. You know that one year might be a little bit higher, one year might be a little bit lower, but you have that sense of security that they're going to do right by you. And that's really what, what I did on WhatsApp is really build out that ecosystem and say, hey, 
I'm going to invest my own capital and I'm going to take you along for the journey. Either I'm going to take you along verbally and show you what I did, or I'll take you along as you'll invest alongside me, whatever capacity you're comfortable with. And really, you know, proof of concept more than anything else, because I, I by nature, I'm a bit of a skeptic, right? So I want to kind of, you know, appease myself and say, hey, this is a, a low risk investment, quote unquote, every investment carries risk, but we've mitigated risk to the best of our ability and my capital's right there with you. Um, and then really scale by doing that process continuously. Now, you know, the, the fund is audited. It has a uh, fund admin, all these things that maybe a couple of years ago didn't necessarily exist, but it's about kind of pushing the needle forward every year to say, hey, how can we create a more institutionalized product, even though our investor is an institutional grade? Because ultimately for all of us, that's what we're looking for when we deploy our own capital. We're looking at it like, hey, how can this contractor that I'm working with mitigate my risk? Right. I can't necessarily day one have 10 years experience with him. I can't necessarily pay him net 60, net 90. Right. Like so, so we're taking that mindset of how do I reduce risk and really applying it to to the client I'm working with first and foremost. That's that's really, you know, cornerstone to to how I approach it and how Veloce Capital approaches it. If that makes yeah. sense. Kevin. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I appreciate that. And you know, just switching gears a little bit, something something came to mind. I think it's uh, very timely uh, to 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 where we're at in, in the marketplace. Um, just more speaking to uh, in, in your co GP arrangement, I know that you you spent a good bit of time really vetting um, vetting your partners in the in the in the various uh, groups that you work with. Um, uh, uh, and and so just would love to hear from you, kind of vetting of a you know you speaking to your, your, your potential client base, right? Investors that are looking to put, to put money with Veloce capital or sunrise capital, any of the syndicators that are out there, some important aspects of, of, of really vetting and honing in on a, of a sponsor, their track record. I mean, I think it's, it's always important. It's always a, a been massive importance, but like, I th I feel like a rising tide has lifted all the boats over the past decade. And so, you know, now that, that the tide's starting to go out, there's surely some folks that have been exposed. And I think more than ever, um, you know, limited partners and potential investors need to be really doing a, a, a deep dive and vetting any potential sponsors that they're going to be working with. So maybe, you know, from, from your perspective, speaking to potential investors, what are some of the key aspects they need to be looking for or questions they need to be asking? It's a very good question. And it's, it's important because it's not mentioned much, you know, in our conversations, right? Like you're not typically when we're having the conversation, we're raising capital. So we're not looking at it from the investor perspective and what questions should they be asking from a due diligence perspective, right? Which is essentially what we're talking about, right? So things like track record are important, but track record is also, no one's ever lived through COVID except just now. It's a one in a hundred year type event. Now, after a decade of low interest rates, you have higher interest rates. So things are changing. What are syndicators doing, investors doing to mitigate that risk? Um, so to your point, it's, it's about having that checklist, which, you know, it's it's kind of easy to find now. You have AI like Chat GPT. You could just type in, you know, what questions should I ask in my due diligence when I'm investing? You know, have they been around? You know, to some things that maybe are less um less standard, like do a background check. Right. So I don't know about you, but like when I'm deploying my capital, it's not normal, it's not the first thing I necessarily think of to do a background check. I would say, okay, I'm gonna deploy capital with people I know. But even the people you know, like, do they file their taxes regularly? Do they have any criminal thing? Have they been arrested? All of these things. And then sometimes when you go to different, more institutional backgrounds, these are the types of things that they're looking at, which is a different frame of mind than the, they say like mom and pop investor, or retail investor, but then somebody who's, you know, starting out and scaling their portfolio, maybe they're accredited, but they're not institutional. The mindset is a bit different. So I think to really answer your question in a succinct manner, Kevin, like when I invest my own capital, I go with my gut. I go with what feels good, what makes sense to me. Like, am I hearing what, what I'm seeing? Does every, is everything in alignment when I'm investing my own capital? When I'm investing other people's capital, there's a lot more checks and balances you have to look at. You have to look at the track record. You have to look at, you know, not only the referrals you're giving you, but they're giving you, but also who does this, who can this referral refer me to that also knows the person that I'm doing due diligence on? Like if I'm talking to Kevin and I'm looking to invest in Sunrise Capital, he'll say, oh, hey, talk to Joe down the street. So I'll talk to Joe down the street and he'll say good things about Kevin, which is expected because Kevin introduced me to Joe. But then you have to kind of say, hey, Joe, do you know anyone else that knows Kevin? And he'll be like, yeah, I know Bob. So I'll speak to Bob and Bob will say, yeah, Kevin's amazing. 
that you know solidifies that hey i got another referral from another source that knows um kevin and that verifies everything that i've heard or in the opposite situation you get feedback that you know caused you to take a step back and say hey maybe it's not the right fit and it's one of those things that at the base level with due diligence it's really important and then it just depends on the investor right like i have I have many clients that it's on WhatsApp I've never met before. And I've had them go from, you know, 50K to over a million, right? And sometimes it's very small things that that make that difference, whether it's, you know, my communication, the deal structure, timing, that's on my end, right? But we're talking about it from a due diligence perspective. On the investor's end, it's, it's also about understanding, hey, what does that risk profile look like? And it's hard because that question to me is a qualitative question. If I'm going to invest in the stock market and I'm going to choose a stock that, let's say, has a dividend, I have cash flow. I have no impact on the performance of the stock unless, you know, it's Tesla and I go buy 100 Teslas or whatever it is. I have no impact on the on the PL or very minimal, right? With real estate, it's it's similar but different. You have no direct impact as a limited partner on the performance of that asset. But the difference is when I call Kevin, when I call Mustafa, he picks up and he answers my questions. You call Elon, he's not picking up. I mean, you can tweet him on X, maybe he'll respond. Right. Right. So, so to me, that's a big factor that matters when I manage my own capital. I don't necessarily know if it's important to investors, but when I talk to them, it seems like it is. That responsiveness is important because they're looking at the economy and they're you know concerned. They're looking at their paycheck. It's not rising that much. The grocery bill is their savings is not, you know, as much as it used to be, maybe. So to me, when, when you're doing due, due diligence, that's really important. And it's not only about, you know, does he answer all the questions in the right format? It's um, how receptive is he to more questions? If I decide not to invest and I say, hey, I'm going to hold in three months, what is his reaction? Like me, right. I'm not an aggressive marketer. That's not my strength at all. That's probably my biggest weakness. Right. So I'm not going to follow up with people to, to invest or not to invest or to raise capital. That's not my persona. Um, but it's contrary to, you know, other people in the industry who are, you know, better at that. They're better at the follow up. So you take that and you say, hey, do I, Mustafa, want to change my persona or do I want to kind of double down on, on my strengths and what works for me? And similarly, when I'm being pitched a product, it's the same way. I don't necessarily want to feel an aggressive call to action because it doesn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. And in fact, sometimes I'll be like, no, forget it. I'm not going to invest, even though it's a product I want because of how I'm being spoken to or how I'm being you know, pitched. And, and for investors, I think fundamentally, and for people, we work with people who we want to work with. We work with people who have like alignment of values. And sometimes these things are qualitative because they help us feel more comfortable. But fundamentally, when you're feeling more comfortable, you also want to understand fundamentally the business model if the business model is ground up construction like what we do how many times have you done a rezoning right that's a question that no very few people ask me right we've done over 400 rezonings it's not a small amount of rezonings right so and i don't know i don't know anyone who's done that many rezonings in the same market right so it's and the market is you know decently small right so it's a very you know niche market so it's one of those things that that to your point kevin you kind of want to look at it and, and understand, you know, the basic questions like how are they making money? How am I making money? Which people don't always ask. Then you want to do due diligence on the person themselves and their network and, and their track record. And then you kind of want to get a bit creative and say, hey, like what are, ask them. What are questions people don't usually ask right. you that you're excited about? <laughs> I'm excited about a 20 year tax of even becoming 30 years. I'm excited about less liquidity in the market because that makes it harder for my competition, which is non-existent, right? So it gets more difficult for the competition to enter the market if every year you're improving. It gets more difficult for competition to enter the marketplace if there's less liquidity. So these are, you know, different things that I look at from my perspective, Kevin, and, and sometimes they come up as questions from investors as well. No, that that's great. I, I appreciate that. And uh, you just made a comment about less, you know, less liquidity in the marketplace, which ultimately is is great for you because it means less competition. So speak to me a little bit more about that and and uh, and, and and your your, your company's viewpoint. And, and you know, are you seeing are you seeing enough distress that's pushing your competitors out of the market that truly is opening up opportunities uh, for your firm, or is it? Or I think you're still not sure yet, right? Like there's still a good bit of uncertainty and uh, the playing field, is it moving so much at this point in time? And what, what are you seeing? 
It's it's an interesting question, Kevin, because the market that we invest in, New Jersey, is not a trending market. It's not a market that's necessarily like everyone's not flocking to it. It's not the Sun Belt, right? Which which everyone typically talks about. Now they're feeling some pain there, but typically our market is is typically expensive to enter. It's typically very high demand. So we have, you know, no issue renting out our units and, you know, the cash flow is high um, in terms of like the rental income that they're paying, not the net operating income, right? But then things like an opportunity zone means our tax base completely changes. And that's a huge strategic advantage for us. Things like the fact that most, you know, developers, you know, there aren't that many developers now compared to maybe 20 years ago. There's less people in development. So what happens is that skill set is more in demand and it's harder for people to build at a competitive price than maybe our developer who is like third generation developer. He, you know, he's very good at what he does and we're very good at structuring deals and raising capital. So it works well as a co-GP, you know, structure. And so to that end, Kevin, I think it's one of those things that, you know, in our market, the largest competitor to us is like a charity. So there's, it's like completely different. We do, mm. we've done over a thousand ground up units. We currently, between us and our code GP, we have over 4,000 units in the market and it's much larger than, than our nearest competitor by, yeah. by like several exponents. So it's, it's a good position to be in where, you know, if your competition is buying a, a townhouse and flix, fixing it up or a duplex and fixing it up or a triplex and fixing it up, and you're buying that same unit, demolishing it and putting up six units, it's it's completely different, the numbers and the ROI, right? Where they're typically trying to do like a burr and maybe, you know, get all their money back. We're, you know, refining and exiting in two years with profit and we still own that asset, right? So the, the numbers work out a little differently and also our tax base is lower because we got a tax abatement and they didn't, right? So the strategy is different but also the ability to execute is much harder, right? Not everyone can go and do ground up construction. Not everyone can do it at, you know, a competitive price. And that's kind of where the challenge is. And that means that there's less competition that's able to enter that market and actually execute. And there's more operational risk as well for, for, an inv for, for a first time investor in that market, if that makes sense. No, it makes sense. Uh, I'm trying to create an abstract of, of of exactly what some of your projects look like. Are these uh, are these more along the lines of like urban infill? Like you, you mentioned, like knocking down a house and then are, are you knocking down houses, single family homes and then building multiple units uh, from ground up above that or what's. Uh, yeah. So what we'll do, for example, is we'll we'll buy a single family house and then we'll knock it down and we'll put up six units or we'll yeah. buy, you okay. know, two or three different plots together, knock them down and do like 40 units. So we have projects that are as large as 188 units that we're doing ground up construction. And then we have our cookie cutter fun type projects that are maybe, you know, six to 42 units. So we have, a, it just depends on, on, on the lot size more than anything got and, it, and the zoning ordinance and things of that nature. Understood. Understood. So last question here before we wrap it up, Mustafa, you know, what, what are you excited about for the next 12 to 24 months? I mean, what, what, what keeps you up in that with excitement? Yeah. I mean, this just feels like there's so many opportunities, at least where we are in the market, mm -hmm. right? We have a lot of equity opportunities where investors can buy in at a discount. And those are like, you know, when we talk about cash flow, we're not even talking about generational wealth yet. And to me, that's what it's all about. It's taking that cash flow, exiting your initial investment, buying more assets, accumulating them in a, in a passive nature for, for us as investors and creating wealth, not only for us as individuals, but for like our kids, kids, right? Generational wealth. And that's really what I'm excited about because right now, you know, it's very easy to get up in the morning and see your, open your Robin Hood and it's red. It's very easy to talk to people and they say, oh, I can't afford milk. I can't afford eggs. Like, you know, there's pain in the market. But that pain also presents opportunity for, for those of us that are, you know, kind of looking for it. And I think that's the situation when it was the beginning of COVID. It's the situation now. And it's always the situation. Like as an investor, the best time to invest is now. So it's about understanding, you know, where is that value creation? If right now everyone is in the office space saying, hey, right now is not the time to enter the office space, find the deals that are the right time to enter the office space, right? It's the same, I think, in storage. Some people are saying there's a lot of hurt because people aren't moving in storage. Well, then maybe that's a good time to really find, you know, those good deals where they need your liquidity. Um, for us, you know, there's just so much demand in, in New Jersey that fundamentally 
although it can be a tough market for some, I think if you have the right team and you have the right experience and, and the right structure, you can really exponentially scale. And that's what I've noticed myself, you know, just over the past few years that really the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, I, I would say that we're, we're actually noticing the same thing. It's interesting, you know, kind of how our business has uh, evolved quite a bit just over the last six months, you know, what would have been a lot of our competitors in the last, you know, six to 12 months, um, especially the, some of the larger institutional players in our space, uh, a lot of them, their liquidity sources have, have dried up to a certain degree or they've just been pencils down for the most exactly. part. And so, um, you know, groups like ours that are, you know, fairly nimble, we're small, you know, we, we can, we can duck and weave pretty quickly. Um, it's really opened up, uh, just an array of opportunities that we, we probably wouldn't have, uh, ever even made it the final best round in, you know, a year ago. And, uh, I mean, case in point, we just tied up a institutional size, uh, grade and size 738 unit, um, at, uh, mobile home park, um, Congrats. In, in a phenomenal market, you know, that like, but we wouldn't have, I'm excited. I'm incredibly excited about it. Just a year ago we would have we would have been really low in the totem pole as far as how aggressive we would have been in the offer compared to you know the x number of competitors that would have easily paid substantially higher prices for that and so it's just exciting that that we're here we're here we're still here we're still doing big things and, again, and i think that's the thing Kevin. They're, it's they're, very they're, exciting yeah well then also i think there's also a lot of other folks that maybe got a little overzealous over the past four or five years and are maybe in damage control now, right. With their portfolio <clears throat> kind of working through debt maturities and other operational inefficiencies. Um, and, uh, and again, just ha have got to, they've had to focus, put all their focus there and not think about buying at this point in time, just kind of, you know, keep their ship right. Um, and have been able to put a time, energy and focus onto new acquisitions or opportunities. So anyway, it's, a, it's an exciting time. I'm incredibly excited. <laughs> no, no, I agree with you completely. And that's the thing, right? Like when we talk about managing risk, you know, when you're in a decade long environment of low risk, people aren't low, low interest rates. People aren't thinking of the risk associated with that. And what if that changes? Meanwhile, the country is trading at a deficit, right? So you're not going to have low interest rates forever. And that's kind of the situation where if we were in real estate five, 10 years ago and we weren't looking at that credit risk, you know, situation and saying what happens when interest rates change, what happens when my interest only loan, I need to get a new loan. It's not always going to be a low interest rate environment. So you kind of need to factor that in and see, you know, maybe it's the right time to take less leverage. Maybe it's the right time to insulate with more cash flow and or look at your balance sheet and look at your investor base to see what is their mentality, what are they looking for, and how do we best align our company with their vision. That's right. That's absolutely. Mustafa, it's been a lot of fun having you, my friend. Um, I, you know, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story and your valuable insights. Uh, you know, for those that want to connect with you, learn more about, you know, what you and your firm are offering and have going on, just where's the best place to track you down? Yeah, I think the best place is probably by email. You can reach me at ml at velocecapital.com. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. That's Mustafa Ladda. Uh, and those are probably the best two. We also have a website, belochecapital.com is a good third option as well. All righty. Well, my friend, I appreciate you joining me and I uh, look forward to having you on another time. Okay. Thank you. Nice all right, guys, that, That's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, that's your host, Kevin, but wishing you huge success. Take care now.